now, let me go ahead and introduce Carter to you. Carter Morgan is a West Central Indiana farmer and consultant. He's been doing some great work in West Central Indiana, as well as East Central Illinois with the farmers in that area, not just in planting green, but stepping into a soil health system, a regenerative ag system, and providing those farmers that support as they have questions, concerns, or just being ready for what may come their way. Carter's going to put up his contact information at the end of this presentation, but wanted to make sure that you had an opportunity to take a screenshot right now or jot down his email address in case you want to get in touch with him later. I'm going to let Carter talk a little bit more about what he does and how he does it. And so we're going to go ahead and go live to a shop outside, outside of Danville, Illinois. Is that where you're at? Uh, to? Just south of Danville, we can we'll say Cayuga, Indiana. Nobody can say Cayuga. So, uh, I think we've got some introductory slides. There we go. So, um, as she said, my name is Carter Morgan, uh, and we're going to be talking about Plan A, B, C, or D for planting green. Uh, this is just a picture of my wife Abby, uh, taken just before we got married. Uh, south of our house, um, just she, we were walking the field one day and she said, take my picture and you can show how big the cover is and uh, you can put it in all your presentations. So that's how all my presentations start. This was about April 20th. So you can kind of see about how big the covers uh, were then. If we go to the next slide, um, you'll see the farm operation. Um, so you'll see me in the middle, uh, my brother to my left, Brent, my grandpa Earl to his left, and then to my right is my dad Brian, and to the right of him is my uncle Daryl. So that is our farm operation. Um, today, you're going to hear from me, um, but it's 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 all of us involved. Um, you'll see equipment here in the shop. It wasn't just me; it was all these guys uh, doing it. Without these guys, I wouldn't be able to do uh, some of these things, present, and go to some of these meetings. Um, for instance, those three are all already in a semi this morning and already hauling grain, uh, so I can so I can stay here uh, and, and do this. And just think about that. Anytime anybody's presenting, especially farmers, um, don't forget that there's always got to be more than likely guys back on the farm uh, that, that that have to get the day-to-day -day things done. And uh, don't don't forget about them because uh, sometimes those guys have just as much information or more information uh, than some of us presenting. So if you go to the next slide, you'll see exactly kind of where we're located. Yes, we're just south of Danville. Um, the, the home base is based out of Cayuga. Uh, you can see we're right there between Terre Haute, Champaign, West Lafayette, Indianapolis. We're about 45 minutes to, to an hour uh, from, from all those. Um, so you can kind of see the location we're talking about. Um, we're right on the Indiana line. That's a time zone change. Um, a lot of the recommendations in Indiana say south of 74 is this and north of 70 or, or south of 70 is this recommendation and north of 74 is that recommendation. Well, if you see, we're directly in the middle of those. So sometimes we're like, which way do we go? Uh, and, and some of those things. So. Um, that just kind of gives you a, a geographic idea. Uh, now you can, I guess, come live. Uh, and so when I'm talking about some of these things, you'll know exactly what, what I'm talking about and, and why we're doing some of the things uh, we are. Um, so we're gonna be talking about planting green. And what that is, is planting essentially corn or soybeans into a living cover crop. Generally that is cereal rye, um, especially ahead of beans. We have had uh, a little bit of experience with some hairy vetch and some crimson clover, rapeseed. Um, we've got some balanza clover uh, we're working on. Um, so those are the things that, that we're talking about when, when we're saying planting green. Um, so just some thoughts, I guess, to get started. Um, how, how, how are we going to do this? How are we going to plant green? Um, one thing that you have to be is you have to be mentally ready for changes. Um, 
planting green is a, is a whole different mindset, especially from a tillage operation or anything like that. Um, so the first part is get yourself mentally prepared. Uh, if you're on this webinar right now, you're already starting to get yourself uh, mentally prepared uh, for that. Um, because you got to kind of have these plans that we're going to talk about and you have to be willing to make those changes, you know, that they may change from 9 a.m. to 1 p.m. Uh, and you, you just got to be be ready to do those. Um, your soil is probably going to act a little different. Um, you know, it, it may look wet when you're planting, um, but when you put that seed in the ground, lots of times it'll just crumble right in or you're going to have more residue to deal with uh, that, that's going to help cover up that seed slot sometimes too. Um, so just think, think through those things. Um, and especially when you're planting, you know, you can't, you know, a lot of things are gonna change, but there's gonna be some things that stay the same. Um, well, if you don't get your seed in the ground, you're gonna have a tough time getting it to, um, so that, that's from a tillage system to a crazy uh, planting green system. Um, definitely gotta get the seed in the ground. And then, what we're going to go, we're going to build off of that. Um, one thing, another thing I would say is have peers available um, to get a hold of. That may be a next door neighbor that's doing the same thing. It may be a guy that's an hour, hour and a half uh, away. Um, because when we're out here, what I call kind of on an island, uh, it can get, it can get kind of lonely, I guess. So, for example, one. <clears throat> If you look back to, uh, I believe it was 2018, I believe was the year that it was really, really wet. And we're in the first part of May, didn't really have anything planted. Um, and we're sitting just, just over here to my left um, one day while it's raining and, and my dad and uncle are talking. And I said, Carter, how much, or my uncle who plants our corn, he said, Carter, how many acres of corn do I have to plant into cereal rye? And I said, well, I don't know, probably 200 acres. And my dad, who does a spraying, he said, uh, you better think again. He said, you got 190 acres south of 36. And I was like, oh yeah, I forgot. I kind of forgot about those. Okay, so you got those and then you got that field. Oh yeah, there's 160 there. Started adding up and it became like 650, 700 acres of corn that's gonna be planted into cereal rye. The absolute what you do not do. So those guys were kind of like, you know, this is gonna be the first time we're gonna do that. You know, that's gonna be a little nerve wracking. And here we are gonna do it on a fairly large scale, at least half, over half of, our, half of our corn acres. And uh, in my mind, I was like, nah, no worries guys. You know, I saw it at the no-till conference, you know, talk to this guy and, and he did it and it worked out fine. You know, we're gonna be, we're gonna be totally fine. And so it kind of calmed them down. I got in my truck and internally I'm sitting here like, oh my gosh, I just lost the farm. Uh, we're going to screw up the entire thing. Uh, what have I done? You know, but in, I knew we should be okay. But, but internally I was like, oh my gosh. So what do I do? I get in my truck and I was like, man, I, what, what am I going to do? So I call Mike Brocksmith in Vincennes and uh, he's in the exact same boat at that time. You know, he said, oh yeah, no, we haven't planted anything. Uh, you know, that's just, just the way it is. You know, you'll be fine, blah, blah, blah. Get off the phone with him. I called Mike Starkey in Brownsburg and same way. He answers the phone. I think he said, hey, you planting rice today or something like that. Are you planting with a boat or, you know, just trying to be funny. And when I got home, those guys helped calm me down because they had done it. They'd been there. They had done these things a, a lot longer than we had but they helped calm me down. Now, when I got home, I was, I was able to tell my wife, you know, internally, like, I'm just like freaked out. How did that turn out? That turned out to be probably the best decision we made that year because it was so wet. The growing cover took up that excess moisture. And when it was all said and done, our corn planted into our cereal rye ended up being our best, our best corn and actually made us the most money. Um, but if I hadn't been to the no-till conference and talked to guys that had done it or had phone numbers of guys to be able to do that, um, we probably would have screwed it up somewhere. We probably would have went out and sprayed it and just had all kinds of, all kinds of issues. So having that peer network available uh, is very important. Um, 
this kind of goes along with it, you know, have the guts to try something different. Um, you know, as, as Rick Clark says, you, you might like how it turns out, um, but start small, you know, don't risk everything. Um, you know, when we first started uh, planting green, you'll see a video later, um, it wasn't on purpose. Uh, you know, I'd just soon have all of our corn and beans planted in April or the first week of May and the covers don't get real big and we're good. The reality is almost every year we have some planted the middle of the end of May uh, that, that this is gonna happen. Um, so there's probably always gonna be some opportunities to try some of these things. And if you plan ahead, you know, all right, that field is always wet. It's gonna get planted later. Um, if we could get a cover out there that could help with some of our drainage. Um, to me, it's not a, uh, not a substitute for tile but it can help uh, with some of the excess, excess moisture. So trying something new is always good. And our agronomist, Melvin Nicholson, um, has a saying that I love, and it, it, when we're doing some of these things new, uh, I, I always think about it. And it's believe what you see, not what you know. So if you get out into that cereal rye field, and you know it's too wet because you've been driving by and you saw the neighbors and it's way too wet and they can't plant, but you get out there and you're like, man, I think I could try it. You probably can try it because you got to believe what you see, not what you know. You know it's wrong, but when it turns out, uh, it, you're probably going to be all right. And that, that happened to us there in 18. Um, we had a neighbor, as we pull into the field with the corn planter into our cereal rye, the tillage neighbor on the other side of the road uh, was out checking his field and he pulled over and he said, are you guys going to plant into that today? He said, yeah. He said, actually Brent's on the other side. My brother is on the other side of the tree line planting beans. We're going to plant corn into this. He shut his truck off and he said, okay, I'm going to, I'm going to watch this. Cause he said, it's too wet. There's no way we started and he couldn't believe it. He was like, you gotta be kidding me. You guys are able to plant into that. Just the different side of the road. He was, uh, he was definitely amazed. So, um, we'll move on from that. We're going to get into some of the equipment available. Uh, having the right equipment is going to make some of this a whole lot easier. Um, some guys do some of this without guidance. Um, I don't know how, um, we, we strongly recommend guidance. We have everything, uh, even when we're crimping, we're trying to, trying to be on guidance. Uh, it just makes everything go easier. Uh, if you've ever put a rope or a, a marker out and then tried to find it on your next pass back, it's extremely, extremely difficult um, to do that. Um, so having guidance, uh, that ability to have your repeatability, just going to let you relax and let you focus on the craziness, I guess, behind you. Um, so that's, that's going to make things a lot easier. Um, if you can show the uh, the wrapped up row cleaners, Jessica will uh, kind of talk about some of the downside. So if you see on the right, uh, it's a pile of row cleaners uh, that is totally wrapped up um, and it, it's a, it's just kind of a mess. So on the left is where the row cleaners should have been that year. Um, and that is, uh, what happens when we planted 30 pounds of cereal rye um, and we were coming in and out of our end rows, our row cleaners were wrapping on us. We had spiked row cleaners and they were, they were catching and we could not actually use our row cleaners. We didn't have uh, an adjustment on them. Uh, so essentially we ended up having to tear them off and we threw them in the back of the shed and uh, did away with them. Um, we put them back on the planter. You can come back live. Uh, we put them back on the planter and um, we were just going to see how, how they were going to, how they were going to work uh, in other situations. So we've got an adjustment now, not the ideal adjustment, but it was the cheap adjustment. Um, but one thing I'll notice, I'll show you is we have one row that is a, shark tooth or razor tooth. Um, and the guys at Martin No-Till uh, told me to try that instead of 
the others. And I'll show you, here's our spike. And if I grab that, you can see how much play there is. If you get a stick or residue or anything in there, there's just so much room for stuff to catch up. If you look at the really in there. And then once it comes off back right there, anything that is, it's supposed to fall, fall off so you're not just wrapping up. Now, we only have one row on. Why is that? Because I'm too cheap to buy all of it. Uh, once the spikes wear out, which will probably be next this year, uh, we'll replace those with, with razors. Uh, we have an adjustment, so now we can raise them up if we have to. Um, and that's just something uh, that we've learned um, is just having the right the right row cleaner. Um, Carter, having yeah. Can you run us through um, those row cleaners again, just real quick? I I heard some about how much slop there was in them, and then it cut out a little bit. So if you could if you could run us back through those again, quick, that would be great. Okay, so this on a spikes, there's a lot of play. On a razors, there's not as much play. So um, my recommendation, especially in the covers, would be go to a razor form because once it's coming out of the ground right there it's going to flop off does that sound better that's perfect thank you okay um so they've already done two planner um things with smarter guys than me so i'm not going to touch too much on it but you if you go back and watch aj's and paul's they can talk through the planners uh much better this is just our corn planner we do have pneumatic down pressure that's helpful. We do have chain drives, but they're hidden, um, kind of blocked here. If you have a chain drive or hydraulic drive, the rows are chain drive. If you have a chain drive from the ground, there is a likelihood of things getting in there and knocking chains off uh, on, on all, a lot of the old planters. The new ones, uh, you know, if you go to a uh, hydraulic drive or an electric drive, um, you can get away from some of those things. Our beam planter is a cable drive. To avoid that totally those are kind of obsolete but that's what we did uh if you come over here this is how our our fertilizer is uh we were a two by two um in 18 it got so wet that we were having problems getting our two by two actually down four inches um and then it caused some planting issues and caused some stand issues so we decided we had to do something different and we redirected from the front and just redirected to the back. This entire system, and we used most of the things that we already had, that cost us like nine or $10 a row. To put a new set of two by twos on was costing us like 150 to $300 a year, depending on how much we, we did. And we were having to replace those every couple of years. This system, shouldn't wear out. I mean, it, it, it's very simple. Um, it's potential volatility here. Um, I mean, if guys are willing to put nitrogen on with wide drops, we didn't think we'd have any as many issues here. Uh, I've seen some guys that will Y these off um, and run them there. Um, AJ on Starkey's planner had something similar to this. You see a lot of guys uh, going to this. The other thing is that got a lot of weight off of our planter. So now we're actually lighter going through the field um, than, than some guys. Um, I do think this is very critical in any no-till, really any situation, but especially no-till and cover crops. Um, we're running about 40 pounds of nitrogen um, at that time and then we're side dressing uh, liquid uh, pretty soon after. Um, so that's kind of how we're getting through that nitrogen bridge. Um, we would have the ability to up that if we had to, um, but we've, we've been pretty successful with, with how we are. Um, as far as closing system, it, it, you know, we've got case planners. We have a, just a normal case closing system, so we don't get into the closing wheel debate um, like some guys. Um, you know, if you want to get into that, AJ's got much better, much better talk about that than I do. Um, I think that's about all I'm going to 
spend on planners uh, for now, unless we have questions here in a little bit. Um, but one thing, if you've ever planted into cereal rye, say after the 20th of May, uh, you're going to uh, know that there is pollen shed, okay? And when the pollen starts flying, I mean, it looks like a dang dust bowl, but it's just pollen. Um, so there's about a three day window there when things are going to be a lot going on out there. So you got some options. You can park the planter and not plant and let that stuff go by. Um, more than likely we're gonna go ahead and plant or, or we may plant another field that may not have cereal rye, but if we are, we're going to keep a leaf blower with us or uh, have uh, some sort of air supply, uh, pneumatic on, on, the, on the service truck or something. But having something like this to blow out the radiator on a tractor, uh, your fans on your planter, uh, the row units, um, it's not hard. Uh, we keep those with the seed tenders and we blow them out as we're, as we're loading seed. So if we run um, anywhere from, from 35 to, to 55 acres on a fill up, you know, every couple hours, we're getting out, blowing them off. Sometimes if it gets real bad, my brother will stop in the middle and go ahead and blow that out. Um, taking a few minutes there and blowing some of that out beats the heck out of having a truck tr tractor shut down on you or you lose suction on a planter, uh, something like that. Um, just something there to, to, to be thinking of. Um, I did see in uh, the March edition of No-Till Farmer, there's a guy in Illinois that built a bracket right here on the front of the planter. It looked like just a big shield that was, that was keeping pollen away from his radiator when he was planting green. Um, there's some engine there. Um, a good windy day is gonna, gonna blow most of that away. Um, I got a good video on my phone. Um, it looked like just a big dust bowl coming off of our field. We've seen these days and it's really just the, it's not dust, it's, it's literally just pollen, pollen shed. Um, also had another uh, neighbor, um, they actually had their sprayer in the field next to them and they were having problems and it was one of their first years and, uh, and Tyler called their sprayer operator and said, hey, just come over here into this field put your booms out and put your booms down. You're not going to spray anything, but just run through the field and just knock the tops off. And so that knocked the pollen down. Then his brother could come through and plant uh, much easier. Um, so that was, those are just some things, you know, we don't always have the sprayer right next to us, uh, but just th those are some things uh, to think about. Uh, when you do have pollen, uh, it, it, it can be a bear, um, but you just having some things in place to, to be able to get get rid of that. Excuse um, me, Carter, I want to um, butt in for a moment with a question here from the Q&A. When side dressing, what are you using to get through the residue? Okay, so when we're side dressing, we have, uh, we rent a, for, for a, call, a, a, a case, um, 2800, I guess like a 2800, uh, applicator. Um, so there's a colder and a knife behind it. Most of the time, it's not a big deal. Uh, in 18, it was a big deal, extra residue. So what did we do then? We took the knives off and we literally, it just became essentially an injection. So we just left it, uh, the tip of the, uh, of the orifice right behind the colder. So then it was just shooting right down in to our trench. Usually we, we have the knife, so it's actually getting underneath the ground. Um, but yes, in high, in high residue situations, uh, you're gonna have to find something like that. Uh, I saw a guy on Twitter, uh, he, he, changed, he had a very similar situation that year and he turned his uh, side dress bar from a Y drop into an I drop. So he literally just had them uh, just out and he was just running it right on top of the ground uh, that way because things were balling up on him. Ways to get around it, uh, we just got to think think through some of it uh, and just go with whatever the best option is. 
Um, so I know when I, I took a picture of it and I sent it to, uh, to our fertilizer dealer. I said, hey, I just changed up your bar a little bit. Uh, looks cool now or something like that. And I could tell like in his response, he's like, what the heck did you do? You know, he was like, oh no, how, how are we gonna fix that? But we, we took knives off, we put them back on, no big deal. We connected it back up. Um, so yeah, definitely, definitely. I mean, guys that run in hydrus, uh, there's so much with that colders and things. And I mean, you're probably gonna have a lot of wrapping. So that's where your liquid comes in and, and you could you could just run your colder and, and just kind of a, essentially an injection system behind it. So, uh, so when we do plant green, so we've got multiple plans, I guess. Plan A, so, so I'm gonna talk about beans essentially. So we're gonna plant beans into cereal rye. Uh, pretty much all of our acres, uh, they're planted beans. Right now they, they have green cover on them. It's not real big right now, but it'll get, it'll get bigger as we get deeper in. So plan A is going to be hopefully plant sometime the middle of the end of April or the first of May. And we get in there and we plant first and then we'll spray. And we would spray something like uh, like a Zidua Pro Dietric Roundup or like these things in in uh, in the tank mix. Um, so that, that's, that's the best case scenario. We plant, spray uh, pretty soon after, uh, no weeds. Maybe we don't have to spray again. Maybe we just gotta do a little cleanup. That's, that, that's the perfect, perfect plan. Next plan. So we plant and we get rained out or something uh, and we can't spray for 10 days, two weeks, something like that. All right, we go scout the field like we need to and we, we start seeing beans starting to emerge. Um, well, our dimetric and the sharpen that's in the pro or the digital pro that will kill our soybeans. So we have to know that we're gonna put those back on the shelf and we're gonna grab like a, just a regular Zidua and Ingenia and Roundup or, or something along those lines. Uh, maybe if you're, if you're Liberty, uh, it might be a Liberty uh, section three or Clethodim, whatever. Um, but we have to know those things. What's gonna kill our beans? What's gonna help our beans, those things. We got we will have all these herbicides on our shelf. Uh, we got about an idea how many acres is gonna be what, but we have to know to switch those so we're not do some damage to our beans. And I'm talking extended flex soybeans uh, when, when, I'm, when I'm talking here, I guess. Um, so, so, those are, so those are the scenarios that, that we're running through our head. And like I said, we're doing our own spraying. Um, so we're doing our own loading and those things. So we can make those adjustments. Um, and dad may have fields. Um, he may have fields that he's gonna spray Zidua Pro Dimetric in the morning, and then he's gotta to switch to Ingenia and Zidua in the afternoon. Uh, that's, just, that's just some of the plans and thought processes that we have uh, set up uh, and we know those things. Um, and all of us are on board with those and knowing what, what has to take place uh, to, to change these things. Um, so the first time this happened where we planted and didn't spray for a while, um, I don't remember what year it was, um, but we have, uh, at my house, there's a, a 220 acre field that has uh, a dredge ditch through the middle. So we have to farm it essentially in two different fields. So we got like 160 on the back side of the ditch and we have about 60 on the front side of the ditch. And my dad's spraying right behind the planter my brother planting, he's on the front side of the ditch where there's 60 acres and he gets that planted. Dad gets done spraying the backside, runs out, we're ready to fill up. We get our phones out and we look at the weather and a radar is showing that it's gonna be here in a couple hours. Dad could probably spray that field uh, or he needed to wait. We made the decision to wait that time and then it continued to rain for 18 days. And 
first few days were good. The, the, you know, 10 through 12, you know, starting to get, you know, about day 15, dad came out and he was like, what the heck are we going to do? We got, we have beans that are literally growing. We got cereal rye that's still growing. The backside of the ditch is dead. Um, you know, what are we going to do? You know, we, we've really screwed ourselves up. We got a cash crop, we got a crop, a cash crop, and it's just terrible. Well, it was a wet year. That side of the ditch does not have much tile. Um, we actually had a great stand. Uh, I think the excess moisture was taken up by, by the cover crop. That year, that ended up being our best beans was that, that side of the ditch. Um, I think that attributes to we had a better stand. It had a better living environment. Uh, we did get it sprayed uh, eventually, um, but we had to make those changes. But like I said, the, what I call the back side of the ditch got a program like that. Uh, the front side of the ditch got a program like this. Um, so that's when, about that year is when we really started making all these changes uh, mentally and having things, all right, we got this, this, or this, uh, and we need to know what we can spray, what we cannot spray. Um, so just have those have those in mind uh, as you're going as you're going through stuff. Plan C is going to be we're going to plant, then we're going to crimp. Um, so this could be corn or beans. We have crimped a good amount of cereal rye. We've crimped uh, hairy vetch, crimson clover, cereal rye in a mix. Um, but most of it's going to be cereal rye after soybeans. Um, so this is a 30 foot INJ uh, crimper. Um, how fast can you run them? You guys ask me, you can, I've had guys run them two mile an hour up to 17 mile an hour. Uh, 17 mile an hour is way too fast. The sweet spot's on about 10 mile an hour. You're not blowing over things, uh, but you're still getting a good crimp. And what we're trying to do with the crimper is on, on those plants, every so often, we're trying to literally just break them. And the hope is that's going to terminate, uh, terminate the cover. Um, so ever hit turkey nests? Uh, I don't know if we hit turkey nests, but you know, we'll run out deer and coyotes and we, we'll run out things in the, uh, oh, you know, rodents or those things in the, in the cover. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's always something out there. Uh, we had a neighbor that actually caught a coyote with his uh, with his row cleaners uh, one year. I uh, had to get a gun and shoot it, so that was that was eventful for him. Um, but we're trying to crimp, so we're trying to terminate that cereal rye and not use not necessarily not use Roundup, but we can minimize the amount of herbicide use. So if we get that mat, if we get that to where we put that down on the ground, then we do create a mat at that point, which is going to help suppress weeds choke out weeds it's going to hold moisture in the summer uh, if you we do get a big rain it's going to land on the, the the cereal rye and work its way in as opposed to uh, just hitting the ground and running off um, so there's several several benefits um, there so timing of when are we going to crimp we will plant our ideal situation is we're going to plant and then we're going to crimp um, we can crimp anytime those soybeans are in the ground. If they're just starting to neck through the ground, we need to stop because if they're running like that, we're gonna break them off, they're dead. We have, we have no chance. So we have a window there, several day window there. If we let the beans get up and growing, we have another window that we can crimp. Necking through, we're gonna break them. Then you have up to, I'm gonna say about six inches. We used to say V2, um, cause that was about six inches. This year we ran into a situation with some guys that their V2 soybeans were about, uh, about a foot tall. So they were extremely tall and were coming through trying to crimp uh, and they were legitimately taking out a third to half of their soybean stand. Uh, so they went from 120,000 down to 60 to 80. Uh, you know, some guys may leave that uh, if it's a first planting early, but when you had 120 and you're taking it down, that's that's hard to leave those. So uh, if they're under six inches, 
that there's enough residue that you can kind of get over the top and not terminate too many of your soybeans. Uh, so it, it's kind of a fine line. Um, and if it gets past that stage, then, then I mean, I would just recommend spraying. Um, we, we, like I said, we're extend flex soybeans. Uh, we, do, we don't run any non-GMO or anything of that, corner beans, anything like that. Um, but that's, those are, those are, I guess, what, what we're doing. Um, while I'm thinking of, of herbicides, you definitely got to think through, you know, have that plan. You know, if I spray this in, in, the, in the summer, you know, fall, I got to have another cover. I don't want to terminate my cover with that herbicide because I want it to go next year to be my weed control. So it's an entire cycle. You know, we're looking 18 to 24 months out. You know, we got this field's going to be corn with this cover and then beans and then this cover and then corn. So we got things kind of planned out ahead so we know what herbicides we can use and can't use. And with the crimper, that can even help us even more if we can eliminate some herbicides, maybe down the road, take out some residuals and just get some contact killers. Um, that, that would be huge. Um, I think I've got some pictures of what it looks like to do, I guess, this system. Um, so this first picture is gonna be probably what cover crops look like about now. Okay, so this is flown on cereal rye. Um, yeah, so March 14th, so here we are March 2nd. So here in a couple of weeks, you know, things might grow a little bit, um, but, you know, if you're looking at that, you're like, eh, you know, what are those covers really doing for me? Probably not much, but they're probably growing down, down in the ground. So if you go to the next, uh, the next slide, you'll see, this is actually the first time we planted into cereal rye. This is my brother planting soybeans. Um, and you see there's, there's cereal rye and rapeseed. It's about 40 pounds of cereal rye. It's not as thick as you might think once you get out there. Um, you can see the pollen I'm talking about. It's making everything yellow. Uh, the back of his cab there, that's not dust, that's pollen. Uh, you really can't see your row units. You just gotta know, uh, you gotta get out of the tractor and check those things. Make sure you're getting your seed in the ground um, and just check every so often and, and just trust trust the process. So like this is May 23rd when he planted. If we go to the next slide, I believe we're gonna be about the end of June. And so, so in, in that first video, you couldn't see my dad spraying, but he was off to the side. This video, I'm riding with dad. He's spraying our post program and it's June 28th. And as we're going through here, as I've watched this video time and time again, in my head, I'm thinking, what were we doing at this time? because there is no weeds. So why were we spraying? We were spraying because you spray. You know, we sprayed our pre, you spray your post, that's what you do. You got, you got two pass program, that's what you do. Well, looking back, we were pretty dumb, I guess at that point, because we should not have probably wasted that, I, I say wasted, spent the extra money to spray that post program because we had good enough cover that we could have not sprayed that field. That saves us a lot of money. That, pa that second pass of herbicide cost us, I'd say about the same as what the cover crop did. Boom, we're already there and we're helping eliminate our resistance. Um, so th those are some things, getting out in the field and seeing these things, uh, scout, what weeds do you have? What pests do you have? Don't just spray to spray, um, but get out there and check those things and you'll know um, what you need to do and what you don't need to do. Um, Carter, just to yep. back up a little bit, um, do you plant a higher population of soybeans when you plan on crimping after the beans are emerged? And um, why or why not? And um, if not, is there a situation where you might consider that, I suppose? Um, so we've transitioned everything to BRT rates pretty much anywhere from 140 to 180 uh well, maybe 120 to 180 so raising that rate i guess no we do not because we don't know exactly where we're going to crimp so we just kind of keep things uh i guess more status quo 
uh, and leave them where they're at, leave our rates where they're at. Um, I guess if you were in a non-GMO organic situation that that is your weed control and you have to crimp and you want that to be the latest possible crimp, then yeah, I'd say you probably want to put some more beans out there to a couple reasons. One, you're going to have a quicker canopy. Uh, and then two, you, you, you do give yourself uh, an opportunity to keep your bean populate, your stands uh, higher in those situations if you're not using herbicides. So I'd say, yeah, that's probably, probably a spot I would do it. That's great, thanks. And uh, maybe you were headed here before I interrupted you, but uh, we had another question come in. Have you since eliminated your post-emergent pass completely? Um, sometimes. So um, this is corn and beans. Um, I would say a up to a third of the a third of the time. Um, yeah, we won't, we won't spray. Um, and that's based on scouting. Um, honestly, our best cornfield this year only had one herbicide pass. Um, it just because we got out in the field um, and walked it and we didn't see weeds. Now, back to one of my first statements was be mentally ready for some of these changes. We were not mentally ready to cut out herbicides. Um, my dad's been spraying uh, for a long time. I mean, they work. We're going to use them. This is what happened. So the first year that we did not spray a post on a soybean field, we only did it on this 90 acres. Um, you know, we had other fields that we went ahead and sprayed, but we said, all right, we, we can try kelch. Let's just try kelch and not spray it. When we came back in the fall, and we're like, hey, guys, where's the weeds? And in our head, we're like, oh. Okay, so maybe we can eliminate this. The, the corn, we didn't have as much guts. Bluntly, uh, we were walking fields. We should have left probably 300 acres. And it was me and my uncle. And, you know, we're walking. We're like, man, there's not weeds. But we were at the stage where the label said we had to spray or we were not going to spray. So we were at a stage where it was spray or don't. We left nine acres and it worked out great. We, we should have left 300 acres. Now we have the guts to do that. Um, at the time, we did not. So back, I mean, we started small and then we've expanded. So my ideal situation, yes, we spray one time at planting and we do not come back at all. But can we do that on every acre? Not exactly. Some of it goes back to what's our drainage in the field? When do we get things planted? Um, if we have a good cover crop and we cramp and we plant and spray, uh, the end of May, there's a strong likelihood that that's going to be our only herbicide pass. Yes. Um, I believe if you go to the next slide, we've got, oh, we've got a time. Looks like we do. Uh, so this is what uh, a field looks like crimped. So this is the end rows of a soybean field uh, that we've kind of double, like double crimped the end rows. So it really got it down. You start to see the beans popping up. Uh, if you go to the next slide, uh, you can see that the beans are emerging right there about the middle of the picture. The beans are emerging uh, through this through the, the rye. Um, you'll see some stray uh, cereal rye coming up. Um, we did not exactly get our timing 100% right. Um, we had some, we, this was a VNS rye, um, but. We're going to lay down most of the most of the rye, and it's going to be pretty flat. Um, but you're going to have some that are going to pop up uh, here and there. More than likely, most of them are not going to give you fits. Um, but just so you know, uh, sometimes you're going to come through, and it's going to be 100% flat. And there's going to be times where it's 95, and you got some of these sticking up. Uh, just just for a visual. Uh, if you go to the next one. This is that same field, same spot. Um, I think this is a field that we did crimp uh, and then we either we sprayed like one time. Um, so uh, yeah, that's, that's kind of what they can look like. That's ideal situation. Uh, the picture on the left, you can kind of see some residue uh, still there, but it, it, it really has been decaying. Uh, if you get this residue on the ground, 
uh, let your earthworms and those things um, eat things up. Um, you know, you can really, really eat your residue quicker, but that's, that's an ideal situation. I will tell you, they don't all look like that, but that's what I wish they all looked like. Um, Carter, mm -hmm. um, would you speak about the importance on sharp double disc openers as you plant green? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, yeah, you, you got to have anything cutting through the, the field. It has to be sharp, essentially. I mean, because you've got this residue that uh, you literally have to cut through. So you want things that you're going to be able to cut through any of that residue. So if you have good double discs uh, that can cut through that, uh, you're not then you're not just dragging a bunch of uh, residue into your seed trench and getting um, getting residue into your seed trench. Um, so yeah, you, you need things that are gonna cut through and, and, and cut those things off. Um, I will say, as I'm thinking here on, on seed trench, so um, if you run smart firmers, we do not run smart firmers uh, from precision planting, but we did have a, um, we had a neighbor that was running them into cereal rye and they could not get the clean furrow reading that, that precision planting says you have to have. And they couldn't figure it out. And after some diagnosis, what happened, what they figured out was their cover crops, they had enough roots down there that they could not get a clean furrow reading because the precision planting smart firma, smart firmer was trying to read. All it wanted to see was just bare dirt, bare dirt, bare dirt. Well, they had so many roots in there that it was giving them a bad reading and telling them that, that they had residue in their trench. Well, they were not pulling residue into their trench. They literally just had that many roots that it was in their trench. Um, planted fine, but the technology that was, t was telling them they were in a bad situation, they were not in a bad situation. So just something else to, to, that, that can come up. Um, I don't know if I have any more slides. Is there another one after that? No. So um, yeah, that's, I, there's my contact information. Um, I guess that's pretty much most of what I have. I don't know if you have any more questions. Um, we do have just a couple well question and a comment um and then as well i actually i think i saw a speaker at the note so conference this year used that leaf blower just like you showed a little bit ago to blow out the seed trench and make sure things are shaped the way you think they're shaped and to to hmm. do their seed counts i don't remember who that was i'll have to go back and look that up but i thought that was a really interesting, interesting. thing um and i've certainly you know digging up seeds is very exciting but it can be very tedious so <laughs> anything that would speed that up <laughs> would certainly absolutely. be good in my mind um absolutely but back to um the plants or how much residue do you knock down when you're planting green um how much residue um probably not as much as you think um, on our 30 inch row corn, um, there's a lot more standing there, especially, um, especially where there are no tires ran. Um, most of that's going to stay standing. Anything that gets ran over with the, with the gauge wheels or a tire or something, you're going to get a lot of that down, but, but a lot of it's going to stay standing. Um, on our 15 inch, we just have that many more row units, that many more gauge wheels and wheels and, and things running over, uh, you're going to notice a significant difference um, with the amount of residue that we're going to, or the amount of rye that we're going to knock down uh, with that. But um, you can tell we've been through the field, but there's times where, um, you know, there's, there's times you drive by some of our fields, especially if they're on 30s and you're like, those guys plant that or did they forget about that or you know and it, it's i mean it's just the way the way it is so there's there's a lot more standing than some guys might think carter have you ever mm -hmm. had mature cereal rye still standing at the time of bean harvest 
And if so, did it create any harvest issues? Yes, that is why that is in the shed right now. Um, so we, when we first started this, so like there in 16, um, I believe it kind of turned off a little dry and, um, sorry, my heater just kicked on. Uh, so it turned off dry and we had um, rye that was still standing didn't get all the way down we came through to harvest and it would cause us some grief harvesting we could only you know we would only harvest a mile or, or a half a mile an hour slower than we would anywhere else um did it cost us yield no but you know when you're ready to harvest you want to harvest you want to get the next cover planted th those things so with it still standing the more residue, it was hard to cut. Um, so it would kind of push up. So in the morning when it was dewy, we couldn't cut through that. In the evening when the dew set in, we couldn't cut. So we, we were having to stop. Um, so that's where the crimper came in. Any field that we crimped uh, years after uh, that residue was down, we were able to gl essentially glide over the top uh, no matter which direction, whether we crimp this way and we cut that way or even vice versa, for the most part, we could stay on top of that uh, residue mat per se, and you, we could cut our beans at just a normal normal speed like anything else. Um, so if it's a wet year and you get enough moisture to push the, push the ride down, more than likely you're gonna be all right. But if it turns off dry and you don't really get any residue to or any moisture to put your residue down, yeah, it can cause some issues at planting. So that's that's why we have that thing in the shop now. Great. Um, clear back at the beginning of your presentation, we had a sixty-four thousand dollar question typed into the chat. Um, did the neighbor who was amazed at your ability to plant when he couldn't with his tillage? Has he since started using cover crops and become a believer? No, he has not. So um, I don't know if you can see. So I work with our local soil and water, which is now the Vermilion Park Soil Health Alliance. Uh, so that is part of my, I guess, side gig is to try to help promote some of these things with producers um, in the area. And he's a guy that I try, um, but he's he's kind of the age where you know I've done it this way so many so long, uh, you know I, I'm I'm not going to change. Um, I get that it's hard to change. It's hard to to think things differently. Um, I we we have two neighbors, or I guess a neighbor and, and my brother's college friend. Um, the two guys that have totally changed their mindset after being on our farm saw it when we were tiling um so we have a neighbor um he farms by himself and he and us bought a tile plow together and started installing tile on our farm and their farm on his farm and he always runs the backhoe and digs our start holes so he's digging on his he starts digging on ours and he gets out of the tractor or the backhoe and he looks at the soil and it had been no-tilled, it was actually no-till corn on corn for about eight years at that time. And he looks at that and he said, my soil does not look like that. Never really said anything else. Before we knew it, he had sold all his tillage equipment and he was no-tilling and now he's cover cropping as well, planting green like we are. Um, but he didn't see it from the road. He didn't see it from um, just even walking the field. But once he got below the surface and saw uh, what things looked like underneath the ground, he noticed that ours looked different than his. Um, my brother's college buddy, um, same way. He, uh, he actually cut his hand one day so he couldn't be out. So we were tiling. Um, so he could come out and sit and watch us tile and, uh, same way, uh, you know, we, we were tiling in an old pasture right here across from the shop and 
the pasture in my grandpa's lifetime had never been worked. It was pasture. We got rid of the cattle and we went straight, straight into no-till and, uh, and we tiled it. And you could see a difference from this side of the road that was, uh, I guess, conventionally farmed, however you want to say it, to the, to the pasture, which is what we're trying to get everything to. You could see a huge difference. So I, I always tell people, if I can get somebody into the field, dig a hole and show them the difference, um, that's where we're going to change minds. That, that's the hard part is getting guys into the field. Um, but no, the, the, the one guy, uh, no, he did not change. I wish he would, but that's just, that's just the way it is. That's a really long answer for that question. Very good. Well, thank you, Carter. And uh, if there's anybody that has any last, oh, perfect. If there's anybody that has any last burning questions, now's the time. Um, we did have one come in. So what's the biggest challenge you have faced planting green? Ooh, biggest challenge. Um, it, pr probably, probably that just that mental, uh, that mental hump there. Uh, just getting, getting ourselves convinced that we can do it. Um, you know, I showed the row cleaners, um, you know, that's a hurdle. That was a hurdle that could, could have told us to stop, um, you know, um, when they wrapped up like that. Um, mentally, that could have just drained all of us and we said, screw it, we're done, uh, you know, but we didn't. Um, so I guess probably, probably the biggest hurdle is just, just ourselves, just, just right here. Um, you know, that, that, that's, that's a hard, hard thing to overcome, especially when we've got guys like, I mean, my, my uncle's farmed, 40 is like 43rd year uh you know he hasn't done it the same way every year um but he's got a lot of experience um of doing it of farming a different way than what we're doing now um so that's definitely definitely probably the biggest challenge that we've faced is just that now i will say that mental challenge is tough but all four of us that are that are owners in the in the operation, we are all on board. Uh, and when when we make a decision, we're, we're together. We're united on that decision, and we go go together uh, and make those decisions. And a lot of our decisions are based off of the data that we have. Um, you know, um, does this decision make sense? Does this decision not make sense? Uh, I'm very much a numbers guy. I want those calculated decisions made uh made well so mentally having those things ready um is 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 probably the biggest thing that we've had carter has that been true from the beginning has was your dad on board from the beginning or did it take some convincing yeah so my grandpa was actually the one that was probably not he wasn't a full-time farmer he worked in a factory and, and just kind of farmed uh part-time but See, I guess I didn't really talk about that. So my dad and uncle, my uncle started farming in 76, I guess, and my dad started in, in 78. Uh, so I guess it's been 45 years. Um, they both worked off farm jobs, um, but they both wanted to farm full time. Um, in the early 90s, they started no-till and soybeans, like 92, 93, and they tried no-till corn. Um, didn't couldn't get the corn to work, um, but they, they tried. Somewhere in there, my uncle met Melvin Nicholson, our agronomist, on a mission trip to Haiti. And um, that's kind of how we joined this journey. Um, and he helped them get their fertilizer, uh, pH is right, those things. Um, and then they started no-tilling everything else. So about 2006, they, they sold all their tillage equipment drove to Kentucky and picked up uh, all their parts to rebuild a planter with Martin uh, parts. So those two really started our journey. Those guys were the ones um, that made the change. It was my dad and uncle. Uh, in 2011 is when they started no till or started cover cropping, um, about 150 acres. Um, we've expanded that to now over 2000 acres every year. Um, just because we saw that it worked 
and we were like, why don't we do this on every, on almost every acre? So now we're about 90% covered and we're trying to get as many acres covered as we can. Um, so those two were actually the ones that, that made the changes um, initially. Um, so I, like I say, I, as I tell people, I farm like my dad and uncle did. I just don't know any different, but no till and cover crops. Uh, Cause I didn't, like I said, we, they were no till and cover crop and in 2011, I graduated Purdue in 2013. So that's when I came back to the farm. So these things were already in place. Um, as dad says, once, once I came back, um, we just kind of really ramped things up because we have the data to show that these things work. And looks like one last quick one here. Uh, by using cover crops, have you been able to cut back on your synthetic fertilizer use? Um, yes and no, I guess. Um, we're not just cutting things to cut things, um, but we have, you know, we're soil testing. Every field gets done every two years. Um, so we're soil testing fairly regularly um, and we're, we're getting our recommendations based off of that. Um, if our levels are showing that we don't need fertilizer, we do not put fertilizer. Um, even our high stuff, you know, we're not putting more than like 200 pounds in any one place. I think our average rate um, that was applied was like 83 pounds. Uh, of map and, and potash. Uh, so, I mean, our, our application rates are down. Um, I think a lot of that is attributed to a solid fertility program for many years. Um, but we're in a position that we can, we feel comfortable pulling things back if we need to. Uh, if price says, hey, fertilizers jumped a lot, which right now it has, we feel comfortable pulling things back, pulling the reins back. Um, to, to, a, to a more sizable level, um, but we are not over applying. I mean, if it doesn't need it, we don't apply it. And we are comfortable with that. Well, sure. And yeah, you can't, you can't afford to over apply anymore anyway. So, um, nope. so you've talked at great length today about how you're planting your corn and your beans. How are you seeding your covers? Um, so about, I said we do about uh, two, a little over 2,000 acres. We're shooting for six to 800 acres. Uh, we're going to fly cereal rye and rapeseed into standing corn. Um, we've had success with that um, for many years. Uh, we know the pilot, first name basis. I, I send him a list. Um, he's flown every single, almost every single one of our fields. He knows the area. He keeps an eye on things when he's flying around. Um, so about a third of it gets done with a plane. Uh, the rest of it is a 30 foot great plains drill that we used to plant our soybeans with. Uh, we just, we rebuild it and we, we drill them. Um, as I tell people, we try to send my brother out and plant about 1500 acres. We give him a smaller planter and we tell him to plant more acres in the fall than he does in the spring. He's got a bigger window but we shrink his planter and tell him to go plant more acres. So, um, and part of that is logistics too. So if we fly into corn, uh, it's gonna grow pretty good. We can drill most of our soybean stubble. Uh, and there's, there's four of us in the operation. So if Brent's drilling on soybeans, dad can keep the trucks away from us. In corn, we need at least two truck drivers. So we really need three truck drivers to keep that away from us. My ideal situation is we hire another truck driver or two and my brother can stay in the drill and he could just drill everything. Uh, seed to soil contact is much better. It just doesn't always, logistics just doesn't help us out there. Carter, are you implementing variable rate seeding when planting green? Uh, yeah. Uh, last year was the first year um, we did that. Um, it worked out fine. Um, the planter operators like that better than a stagnant rate. We used to just run a stagnant rate um, of each field, but it would change and they had to go in and, oh man, I got to find the paper and change those. Now I just have them uploaded. 
they just have to go in, pull up their script, boom, and the planter plants. So, uh, yeah, it's 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 much simpler. And what are you basing that rate on? Is there anything particular? Uh, mainly historical yields. Um, so we've got 10 to 12 years of yield data um, on SMS, Hegelator SMS. And there's a function there that I can run an analysis um, with all these corn and bean yields together. And it'll put it all together and it will give me one map that shows my highs and lows. And then I can just pick each area and I can add more or less seed on those. So I'm doing that myself. Uh, just this last question here, and then I think we are over time, but are you writing your own scripts or are you working with your crop advisor to do that? Uh, seeding, I'm doing them. Uh, fertilizer, uh, we're using, like I said, Nicholson's. So they, um, I guess any nitrogen, any VRT nitrogen, I, I would write, uh, and any uh, seed I'm writing, but any P and K or lime, uh, they're writing. Very good. Well, thank you very much, Carter. And just as a reminder for everybody, we do have this recorded and we will get this posted to our YouTube channel. Uh, and all the registered attendees will get an email once we get that up.